Okay, yes, uh, my name's Jonathan Atkinson. I'm from Carbon Co-op and I just wanted to welcome everyone to the webinar this evening. Um, this evening's webinar is, as it says on the tin, an introduction to heat pumps, um, which will be with myself and featuring Florence Collier of Humblebee, who's our, our expert for the evening on heat pumps, uh, all things heat pumps. Uh, apologies to anyone who was hoping to be on the webinar that we held, that we were going to hold on Monday, which was around uh, energy assessments. Fortunately, Marianne, who was hosting that, had a rather heavy cold. Um, so we'll be rescheduling that for very soon. <clears throat> but yeah, uh, tonight's all about heat pumps. So just some housekeeping. Um, as people always ask, the presentation and the recording is available afterwards, and we'll circulate that on email, and it's available on our website, along with all the other webinars we've been doing uh, during lockdown and a little bit before as well, on retrofit energy systems, all things. Uh, do get involved, share links, say hello in the chat. Uh, the majority of the presentation is going to be floor tonight, and so I'll be on the chat and uh, interacting as well. If you have a question uh, during the webinar, please pose that in the Q&A. Um, the chat is just for kind of interaction, the Q&A for specific questions. We'll present for around an hour and we'll have 30 minutes at the end for questions. Um, at the end, we have a really fun feedback session exercise. So please do stick around for that. Uh, it will be interactive and fun. And do feel free to tweet us during the session at uh, carbon.coop. Okay, uh, oh yeah, and if you're interested, we run tons of training, all webinar based at the moment. And if you go to Carbon Co uh, website, the events, uh, which is the top right hand uh, corner of the menu, you can see there, obviously there's heat pumps, but we have a beginner's guide to retrofit coming up, for example, uh, some specialist training for consultants, professionals and contractors, and yeah, all sorts of things coming up. Uh, so yeah, have a look. So heat pumps, um, how did we get here? Um, I would say that interest in heat pumps has gone through the roof in the last two, three months, uh, really off the scale. And one of the biggest things I would put that down to are things like climate emergency and uh, stories in the press about gas uh, being, uh, gas boilers being uh, defunct in a few years and no more being installed and that sort of thing. And for people that want to do something to decarbonize their home, it feels like a very, very tangible thing to rip out the gas and uh, install a more renewable, uh, more low carbon solution. Uh, and so, yes, tons and tons of interest. Really, from my point of view, we've been involved in Metrofit for 10, 15 years now. Heat pumps have had really rather poor name, especially air source heat pumps, uh, which we'll talk about in detail tonight. Um, they've been seen as not reliable, not delivering the kind of promises made in advance. And really kind of gas boilers were seen as more reliable and just to stick to them for the time being uh, and you know where you are. For, for us, it changed, that kind of view changed a lot down to a visit to Ireland last year, a Tipperary Energy Agency, it's kind of similar thing to Carbon Co-op, but municipal, uh, Tipperary obviously in the, in the center of Ireland. Um, and they are running a deep retrofit program and have been for about four years now. And the retrofit program uh, heavily features heat pumps. And I think in Ireland, the contrast is even more stark because you have homes there that are heated by peat which either come in briquettes or people dig it out of their garden, dry it and burn it. And that's awful in lots of ways. And heat pumps are, you know, a key kind of, uh, you know, uh, way of tackling that. <clears throat> and in Ireland, uh, there's a blog post there if you want to read it in more detail, but they've done loads of work on heat pumps and they've done, got loads of data there. And the, the data, which comes from uh, academic sources as well as themselves, really told a different story around how heat pumps could be made to work in a domestic setting on a larger scale than we'd seen in the UK. And for us, uh, myself, colleague Marianne, who's going over there, it, it, really, it really changed the kind of assumptions that we had around heat pumps and became advocates of them and how could we do more here. So that's one of that's a bit of background, climate emergency, uh, trip to islands, and um, also you'll have heard, uh, many will have heard, Green Homes Grants, the new uh, government incentive launched this very day. Uh, people might have heard or seen stuff around. Um, the heat pumps are a primary measure fundable under Green Homes Grants. 
there's lots of pros and cons to this um, session. So yeah, um, sorry, to this funding. So um, I would really uh, suggest people check out our briefing that we've done. There's a link there. We've done a webinar and a briefing and all sorts of things. Uh, but yeah, it's an option in this space. Uh, yeah. And I will talk about this later, but in the context of people powered retrofit, our end to end retrofit service, heat pumps really make sense because we're combining um, a heat pump, a radical different approach to heating, along with a whole house approach to retrofit and, and energy reduction as well. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, so that gives you a bit of a context. Uh, Florence, I'll let uh, Flo introduce herself in, in, in more detail, but Florence is, a, is an engineer. She's got a lot of experience in, in the area of heat pumps and energy systems, and um, she's working with us on people powered retrofit um, to help specify and design systems. So yeah, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Florence. Thanks, Jonathan. I'll just... Uh... Share my screen then. So, I've lost my notes though. Right. Hi everyone. It's really great to see so many of you um, on this webinar tonight. Uh, a very wet night for most of us, it seems. Um, so we're all cosy indoors. Um, so yes, my name is Florence Collier. I'm a mechanical building services engineer and also a certified passive house uh, designer and now um, the Carbon Co-op's newest retrofit assessor so I'm very pleased to be here tonight um, and there is lots to cover tonight so I am just going to crack on um, as Jonathan said um, any questions um, keep them easy please um, in the Q&A and we'll um, We'll hopefully address those uh, at the end. Um, so I'd like to focus on six um, key areas that you need to bear in mind if you are considering um, a heat pump for your home. Um, and hopefully um, we'll be able to go back and see that we've, we've covered most of the things that um, you need to worry about or that you are worrying about at the moment. Um, and uh, in our view at the moment, the uh, those key things are one it's it's not a boiler so how does how does a heat pump work um, and what's the what are the differences um, in terms of um, how heat is is uh, produced and delivered um, what do I need to do to my house to make it heat pump ready so um, you'll have already heard that um, as a people powered retrofit outfit we um we like to look at the the whole um system and the whole problem um you will find that uh, there are lots of components to a heat pump system and um that might well need um additional space to the, the space you have um allocated to your heating systems at the moment. So uh, we'll have a look at those and also um, what your budget might be to cover those, those installations. Um, and then hopefully I won't have lost half of you because you've decided it's not for you. Um, but you know, bear with me, uh, there might be a few things or silver linings um, and you could decide, yes, I'm going for it. So what's the, what's the process? What are we going to, um, how are we going to procure this particular installation? And part of that is design it, designing it properly, um, sizing it for the right job. Um, the other thing to consider is that there are so many types. There's, there are um, different types of um, heat pumps. I'll be covering mainly air source heat pump uh, systems, but a lot of it can be applied to other types. But within that, there are um, there are other types, so we'll um, we'll have a look um, and what's best for your needs, and also uh, in terms of uh, um, delivering hot water to your taps and uh, showers. And um, at the risk of boring you with another three-word slogan, um, finally, uh, install, operate, and monitor. So um, we'll quickly go, go over those things and I hope 
we'll have time to, to look at those um, in depth. So moving on, a heat pump is not a boiler. Um, and you probably already know this, um, but how does it work? So we'll quickly go through um, what a heat pump um, does to get to deliver energy. So the easiest um, example of a heat pump that you will have come across is the fridge. So um, the aim of the fridge is to keep um, food cool and that's by re removing heat from the actual um, food. Um, it's, it's done by using a refrigerant that's pumped between the two zones um, that are at different temperatures. Um, you have your four main compress uh, components, the compressor, the condenser coil, the expansion valve and the evaporator. Um, and you put in electrical energy into the uh, compressor and that's why your fridge consumes energy um, to work. So um, uh, as the hot refrigerant liquid goes through the expansion valve, its pressure is reduced, so um, it causes it to, to, to go cool um, and it starts its transformation um, from liquid to gas. Um, heat is taken out um, of the low temperature zone, which is the inside of your fridge, through the evaporator coil. Um, and then this gas is, uh, is driven into the compressor and that's where you put your electrical energy in. Um, and then the heat uh, that you've produced um, is rejected at the back of the fridge, so to the surrounding air at the back, and then it's the cycle is repeated. It just keeps going around in that loop. Um, so you're putting work in, and that's um, that's in that um, with that electrical energy, um, but you're getting heat out at the back over here. So your fridge is a heat pump. Um, it's a heat pump, it's, it's a fridge in reverse. So uh, the air source heat pump will um, extract the heat from outside, even if it's cold, it can still extract heat from a cold environment, um, as you can see from the fridge. Uh, it uses the heat to, um, that heat to heat your water and um, and this heat pump needs to be outside your property for um, so it either extracts heat from the ambient air um, or from the ground if it's a ground source heat pump um, or whatever is your uh, source. The components are exactly the same. Um, now as you can imagine um, we're, we're extracting heat from low um, temperature sources so the, you can't really expect the delivered heat um, on the other side to be that high either um, so uh, however good your refrigerant is so um, the key thing to note is that the um, water temperatures to your boilers to your um, radiators will be a lot less a lot lower than uh, than from a from a boiler uh, and because of that, your radiators won't be the right size necessarily um, to do the job. So um, we've talked about different installation types. You've got ground source and air source. So uh, with ground source, you're exchanging heat um, with the with the ground, uh, usually at much sta much much more stable temperature, which is why you tend to get um, bigger um, efficiencies um, or from the air. Uh, within the air source um, heat pump category, you get monoblock, which means that um, the whole of the whole of this is in the same machine outside. Um, whereas the uh, whereas the split system uh, would split those two um, those two circuits um, and uh, only have the um, the, air, the heat extraction part. Um, outside. That does mean that you have refrigerant go, uh, going between the two, so it's a different type of installation and um, we'll have a look about, at that 
later. So things to consider straight away are um, you've got an outdoor unit, so you need to find a, a space for that. Um, and then you'll have an indoor unit, whether that's um, that's a, a refrigerant based unit because it's a split unit or a, a water based unit. You will have something in, indoors and that might be a, a buffer tank as well. Um, all closed systems at, at high temperature or higher temperatures um, need expansion vessels. This is to allow um, hot water to, to expand within the system and not, um, and not break the pipes. Um, and unlike a combi boiler, um, you, you will not be able to do um, instantaneous hot water. So you will need a hot water cylinder um, for your hot water needs if that's, you know, if you don't have any other way of getting hot water. Um, but all this is, uh, can be uh, integrated with renewables. So um, the future's bright um, from that point of view. Now, a brief explanation um, of COP, the coefficient of performance. This is what we use as a, uh, to define uh, the efficiency of a heat pump. And um, really it's the heat out that you get based on compared with the electricity work input that you put in. So there, you know, there's a couple of representations there. So if you have one kilowatt of electricity in and you get four kilowatts of heat out, uh, then your COP at that point um, for those particular conditions um, is four. Um, and the sort of declared COPs in manufacturer data sheets are determined um, in laboratory testing. So it defines source and heat flow temperatures. So for example, um, your cold reservoir might be seven degrees and they have to state that and your flow temperature or your hot reservoir is at 45 degrees and they have to state that. Um, so those temperatures must always be quoted along with a COP, otherwise it's meaningless. Um, and then the other efficiency um, measure that is important is the seasonal performance factor. Now, this is measured annual efficiency of a heat pump at a particular location um, and it's given over the whole uh, heating season, but it's essentially the sum of all the electrical energy in um, uh, on the denom denominator, sorry. Uh, so the heat out um, over the heating, the electricity in, but not the average COP. Um, let's not get too, uh, too bogged down with those details though. So, Heat pump efficiencies, right. So there is a theoretical maximum COP, which I've put in a cloud there because it is pie in the sky. Um, the absolute best uh, efficiency will be, you know, at best uh, half the Carnot uh, efficiency equation. But what the equation shows you is how dependent the efficiency is on, um, or the COP is on the temperatures of the cold and hot reservoir. So um, if you have a large um, difference in temperature between the two, then the denominator is, is, is larger, um, which makes your COP smaller. And also the higher the, the temperature of your cold reservoir, uh, the, um, the higher the COP, everything else being the same. So, um, in terms of um, actual COPs, this is a bit more representative. Um, for example, um, if your outdoor temperature is five degrees um, and you're heating your hot water to 55 degrees, um, typically your COP in that, in that case is only 1.5. However, if you're heating your swimming pool in the summer and your delta T is, is just 10 degrees um, with, a very, with quite a high um, cold reservoir temperature, then your COP might well be five. With ground source, um, it's it tends to be a little more reliable over the year just because the temperature is slightly higher. So your cold reservoir is always a little bit warmer 
Um, so in this particular example, and with underfloor heating at 35 degree flow, um, you can get a, um, you can generally get a COP of four. Um, whereas if it's feeding low temperature radiators, then your COP um, might drop to three. So that's that's for you know 45 degree um, flow. So uh, traditional boiler installation. Uh, boilers are straightforward. You burn fuel for fire. Fire heats water um, to a high temperature. Water heats house, and that's um, how we've always done it for the last few um, few decades. Um, <clears throat> and they're you know they're pretty. Um, uh, they're not terribly fine tuned, especially in, in the domestic sector. So you just tend to get um, a particular size based on the size of your house um, and typical heat losses. And they tend to be over 20 kilowatts. Um, they might even be rated higher um, if, it's, if they're combi boilers and you're, you're giving instantaneous hot water. Um, so the operating temperatures um, are about uh, are in the range of 60 to 80 degrees. So um, um, that's important to know. And the typical heat losses from UK dwellings are uh, 150 to 250 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum. So that's, that's just something to bear in mind in terms of um, where we're starting at um, in heat demand. In contrast, a so a heat pump could, in, you know, a heat pump installation could, in theory, deliver that that amount of heat, but it would be um, very, very large um, and certainly not economically viable. Um, the um, also it would be sized for the peak and um, not necessarily, um, and the peak being maybe your hot water demand as opposed to your your um, your heat losses um, which means that most of the time it's running inefficiently um, the other thing to consider is that you will be switching to an electricity based uh, heating system so uh, if electricity is usually about two and a half to three times the cost of gas um, you really uh, even if you had money to burn as it were um, you really would like to see um well aim for an average cop of two and a half to three or you know reduce your heat load so that that's that's um at least the minimum possible um analyzing how you use hot water um for showers etc is is quite a key uh, element to keeping the size actual size down um and then operating temperatures are usually um quite a bit lower, so in the range of 30 to 50. That means that radiators um, would need, you know, if you, if you didn't do anything to your house, your radiator would need to be a lot larger to deliver that same output. So significantly reducing the heat losses from your home um, and designing the hot water system appropriately, um, you can keep the machine size low and therefore the cost as well. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about um, uh, whether your home is suitable for a heat pump, there's a, a good blog on there. And all these references and links will be at the end uh, on the resources page um, for you to take down. Um, right. So dwelling on operating temperatures a little bit, um, what, does, um, what is that going to mean to us? So the difference in temperature between the room air uh, and the average system temperature inside the radiator, that's your um, DT in this case, your delta T. So given what we've, we've said before, um, if that DT is 20K as opposed to 50K uh, for your boiler system, you can see that your output um, will be severely um, reduced. Now, if it were proportional, uh, which it's which it's not, um, it's actually a bit worse. That means that a meter length radiator that gives you a theoretical output of a thousand watts um, would with, um, with 50 degree delta T and therefore your boiler system, it would only 
emit about 400 watts when um, supplied by the heat pump system. So uh, your options are, what does this mean? Um, do you more than double the number of radiators in your house? Um, do you install underfloor heating throughout? Um, do you adopt a whole house approach to reduce the amount of heat needed by each room uh, to maintain your comforts? And that's a little bit of a leading question. So um, uh, basically to uh, illustrate some of this, um, what would you end up with? This is a, um, an uninsulated stone um, farmhouse with an open fireplace as top up heat, um, a monoblock installation with, um, this is the indoor unit that also has the hot water, domestic hot water tank um, and buffer. Um, and that's a 14 kilowatt um, installation, no, 16 kilowatt installation. Uh, this is a 10 year old installation, um, a lowish energy bungalow with underfloor heating throughout. And this is an eight kilowatt split system um, uh, installation. So that's the outdoor unit and the indoor. Uh, Andy Hamilton, you might have heard his webinar um, where he's he's approached things slightly differently. He's just decided I'm going for a five kilowatt uh, Mitsubishi Ecodan, slightly older model than um, you can find at the moment, um, and then uh, adapted his house uh, to suit, having done already um, quite a bit of work on it um, over the years. And this is a very recent installation, uh, an eight and a half kilowatt um, Mitsubishi Ecodan um, with a very slim uh, 150 litre. Um, uh, cylinder and this is quite a small semi um, but we'll talk a bit more about that a bit later. Great so second point how can I be heat pump ready and that's the leading question um, that I said earlier at the carbon co-op and also in my own um, consultancy work we, we take a whole house approach to, um, to retrofit. And that means um, looking at the, the house as a system, the home as a system. Um, so there are plenty of processes that go on um, in terms of heat transfer. Uh, the main one is your fabric heat loss. So through this envelope here, walls, floors, um, windows, roof. You will, um, if you're trying to maintain a certain temperature inside, you will lose heat to outside um, as soon as it's colder outside. And that's that. Um, you will also lose heat through ventilation, um, generally because you're pulling cold, cold air in, uh, whether, whether that's because it's leaky or whether it's controlled uh, in an extract kind of way. Um, and therefore you have to heat that volume of air that's coming in. Uh, on top of whatever you lose. Add to that some internal gains. So you've got, you know, lights on, computers, TVs, um, that will provide some heat inside the space. You also have solar gains through windows. Um, and then whatever's left in terms of um, the heat required to maintain uh, those systems is the um, is the heat that your uh, your heating system has to put in that's the work that's needing to be done in that particular instance and you know put people inside a home and uh, the home will interact with all these systems in different different ways some some we understand quite well others are difficult to predict um, and it's important to recognise comfort as being quite subjective as well. <laughs> Myself being pretty nesh, as they say, in these parts. Um, so, um, what do we mean by a whole house approach? Um, actually, we look at the fabric first. So, um, we, we drive down the heat demand um, as, a, you know, as a whole system thing. Um, and that's our 
that's our best chance and our best legacy, I think, to um, uh, to future generations is to retrofit our homes to the best of our, our abilities just now. Um, to reduce that demand because um, we won't be able to all switch to heat pumps um, overnight and also um, to make sure that we can meet that demand through renewable energy. So uh, drive down that demand with um, extra insulation, um, air tightness, all those things. It has a lot of co-benefits. You have much more even temperature, stable temperature, um, as well as um, a healthier environment as well as reducing your energy use and your bills. Well, bills if you do it the right way. Um, and then we can make, meet our, our more stretching targets like the carbon neutral um, targets that we will be setting ourselves um, as soon as possible. Um, so we require the building services to do less work. Uh, we use the energy more efficiently. And once we've done that, uh, we can then supply the the, um, the energy from renew renewable sources. Um, how low do you go? So, um, well, if the if for a particular house type, um, we're looking at 140 kilowatt hours per square metre. Um, would you go as low as the inner fit, which is passive house or retrofit standard? So the, the, that particular standard requires 25 kilowatt hours per square metre a year or less. Um, and then a low energy standard as, as uh, defined by the AECB would be in the region of uh, 25 to 45 kilowatt hours. Uh, it's, I think it's based on um, improvements over current building rigs, so that target might move. Um, but the lower you target your energy demand, the better match your radiators will be and more temp even temperature is throughout. Um, and the better your heat pump system will, will perform as, as a result. Um, so can we apply passive house and retrofit? Well, um, 25 kilowatt hours uh, per square metre is, uh, is actually a relaxed target from passive house, which would normally be 15. And it recognises that there are a couple of things that you can't do in retrofit that you could do in rebuild, obviously. So form, you can't do anything about. That's the, um, that's the surface area, um, your heat loss area. All the walls etc um, um, compared to the volume um, that you're trying to trying to heat um, you can't really do much about that unless you're doing a um, uh, you're doing an extension for example where you might think about these things also orientation um, you you're facing the way you are at the moment um, so you can't really optimise necessarily for south um, south aspect windows. Um, so the other things you can work on are insulation, um, triple glazing, and everything else is just a little bit more tricky. So air tightness, um, mechanical ventilation, and uh, those thermal bridges, and um, but also uh, shading will um, for summer comfort. Uh, will be, be a lot more tricky with the retrofit, um, which doesn't stop us though. <laughs> well, they, they might stop you at the moment, um, but they're all um, things that we can we can do something about. Um, just briefly on air tightness and ventilation. So, um, to have a healthy um, home, you you do need to change the air um, uh, on a you know, by bringing fresh air in. Um, and the best way to do that is in a controlled way. So what you don't want is, is just leakiness um, because you don't actually know where that um, air is going um, and it might be exactly in the wrong places. So um, the amount of energy you need for ventilation is actually a, a fraction if you recover the heat um, compared with that that you that energy that you need to heat up the air to the same temperature. So um, it does make sense even in retrofit to um, look at air tightness and try, try and drive that down as much as possible. So with a, you know, with a new build, 
even though it's it's hard, you would be, um, you would have a continuous barrier to um, air around the whole building. So in retrofit, you would just try and um, try and um, do what you could really. Um, and then with mechanical ventilation, um, it, what we're trying to do is provide um, fresh air, filtered uh, fresh air to your uh, rooms and uh, remove um, what we call vitiated air um, through the uh, kitchens and bathrooms. Um, and But before we, we exhaust that air, we'd like to recover the heat from that. Thank you very much. So um, we use an MBHR unit with a heat exchanger inside. Right, so, but having said that, um, we're not looking for perfection. If you, you know, it, we need to do what we can uh, with the budgets that we have. So aim to do as much as you can. Um, if you are a perfectionist, apply that to those areas where you can um, make it best. Um, and also speak to your builder um, about quality workmanship. Um, check what you know. Make sure that they know that your standards are that high, um, and that you'll be um, uh, you'll be expecting the very best from them. Um, and they can take pride in that, and that's um, uh, that's an opportunity, I think. Right. So do I have space and do I have the budget? Um, okay, so where, uh, where do we need to locate all these, um, these components? So monoblock block system, because it's, um, uh, it's relying on um, a smallish pump, um, I think I think you're restricted to about 12 meters in terms of um, the length. So it really does need to be near the house, next to the house. Um, the split system, you have a bit more um, flexibility with that. Um, so the, inter the external unit can be um, up to about 50 meters from the internal unit. That's refrigerant pipe work that, that circulates between the two. Um, so it needs a, a registered installer. Um, but that might be the more suitable option for a larger house. Um, and then you need to locate a domestic hot water cylinder and thermal store somewhere close to the unit because you can't have that instantaneous hot water. So if you don't have one now, uh, you'd need to identify a space or a cupboard um, where it will fit. And then on top of that, you will have possibly a puffer buffer tank, not, not in all cases, um, a water filter, uh, a pump, expansion vessels, and all that, and the controls. Um, so this is a just a diagram that shows exactly what we've uh, we've said. So an outdoor unit, an indoor unit. This is a Dakin installation. It happens to be um, your three port valve, which will send um, preferentially wa um, hot water to your hot water cylinder, heat it up, um, and then uh, or Radiators. Oops, sorry, it's my um, And uh, that's a pretty standard installation, but there are other ways of doing this as well, and you might need um, some extra bits and pieces. Um, in terms of how much it costs, uh, well, it does depend on your heat pump size, but a lot of it is down to labour. Um, the extent of the system installation, whether you do need a, a new hot water cylinder, new radiators, controls and monitoring. It depends on the warranties that you're getting from the uh, installers. Um, and it also depends on whether you go for the grants, um, which will touch on uh, the renewable heat incentive and the green homes grant. So there's quite a large um, price range there. Um, I haven't heard, although I haven't seen a quote for five thousand pounds, <laughs> um, although I'm told that that's that is possible. Um, but they do go up to sort of fourteen thousand, especially um, with the RHI systems. In terms of our um, RHI, you can um, check your eligibility by going on the Ofgem uh, website. But generally, it's about 
using a heat pump for space heating um, and domestic hot water, um, but it has to have the space heating element and a minimum seasonal performance factor of 2.5. So um, that's um, that. The other thing is you will you will need to do some insulation work, just not to the extent that we would expect to do. Um, and it's calculated on a recent EPC, and so you'll have to get that done uh, as soon as you've got all your um, your interventions um, done. So any extra insulation or um, or windows, and based on the size of the installation and the kilowatt hours um, that you're generating, you will get a grant, and that's paid over. Uh, paid back over seven years. So actually, you do have to put the capital up, um, which I think has put a lot of people off uh, in the past. Um, so, but then it's it's paid back over seven years. Um, there's a cap in terms of yearly consumption, so that's another reason why you might want to, um, uh, although that's quite a high cap. Um, and then the other stipulation, obviously, is that it is a registered installer with the MCS. So the MCS has a website, and so you can search it for your um, closest installers, as I've done here for Manchester. Um, I won't say too much about the Green Homes Grant Scheme because um, there's, I think, literally today some new information came out. Um, and also the Carbon Cult have written a little briefing sheet, which you, um, if you're a member, you will have um, received. So uh, do have a look through there. But, but essentially, you can get the uh, Green Homes Grant for heat pumps. Um, my understanding so far is that um, that portion just doesn't get refunded to you um, if you do go for the RHI as well. But you can go for, for both. Um, it's just a, a question of cash flow again. Um, you can go on the Simple Energy Advice um, website and just it'll take you through um, some questions and you can end up with a, with a plan and eligible, um, um, eligible improvements. So in terms of um, viability, just to recap, so have you got an outdoor and indoor space that's, um, uh, that's sort of adequate? Um, do you have outdoor noise criteria you need to meet? Um, have you checked your radiator sizes? Um, definitely do some accompanying retrofit measures um, and I would say include some mechanical ventilation at some point in that. Um, Work out costs and your cash flow. Have you um, can you afford to do this? Um, and just remember that economically, um, the numbers might not stack up to start with, um, unless you do um, um, improve your um, your fabric uh, and your home energy. Uh, switching from oil is definitely economically viable, but but gas being um, as low as it is compared to with electricity, um, just just be wary, uh, just be aware that your bills might not be slashed in the way that you, you think they will be. However, if you did look at this, the CO2 equivalent, your carbon emissions, um, then yes, you will be doing, um, you'll be having a vast improvement on, um, in terms of impact. Um, just checking in with Jonathan in terms of time. Yeah, um, uh, we've yeah. got about um, just over 10 minutes. So I'll okay. give you a shout at five minutes as well. So. Okay, all right. <laughs> we'll be rushing through. Um, so you've decided to um, go for it. Um, I just wanted to say, um, if anyone's confused in terms of kilowatts and kilowatt hours, uh, kilowatts is the graph so it's it's the power or work and that's that's an instantaneous measure um whereas the consumption is the area under the graph so you can't necessarily go um 
from your energy bills um, uh, in terms of consumption and extrapolate a size or a peak load from that because um, you won't know how variable this is um, in terms of the profile. So um, how do we determine the size of an air source heat pump or any heating system? Then we, we look at the heat losses. And for that, um, we use U values, which are um, properties of the material. Um, and it's the rate of heat loss uh, per degree difference in temperature between inside and out uh, per square meter of wall floor area um, that you have. So you need to know the materials, you need to know their thickness and their thermal conductivity to find a U value, or you can use U value tables from, from other data sets. Um, you can't add U values together. Um, so uh, if you know the U value for a, for a specific uh, insulation material, that, that still has to be built up um, like you would electrical resistances. For example, um, you'd have to add the inverse of each of those uh, and then get the inverse to get the U value. Um, so this is a, a diagram from the Home Energy Retrofit um, report and it will tell you, um, so this is already, this has already multiplied the U value by the areas of those particular elements. And then your total is um, is the sum of those. And then, uh, in order to get that that heat loss overall, then you uh, decide on the design temperature. So, say Manchester is, is minus four, um, and your internal design temperature, so say twenty. Um, therefore, your DT here is is twenty four degrees, and that will give you your peak um, peak load. Um, to determine the size of your heat pump. Um, if you're then going to check on your radiator sizes, you need your room by room heat losses. So you do exactly the same calculation, but just based on each room. Um, and in terms of your calculator, uh, your radiator emission capacity, you would need to look up um, the manufacturer data tables really to get the best to get the um, the more accurate um, outputs for different um, different temperature differences. Uh, your domestic hot water options. I'm just going to cover two here. Um, so you can have an unvented cylinder that's more traditional, um, and your the water mains water fill is fills that up and gets. Um, heated up um, and then is used in your um, in your appliances. Um, you can store at a lower temperature, but you would need um, and and that's exactly what you would do with a heat pump system. Um, but then you would need some kind of Legionella control loop. So that might mean raising the temperature of that water to sixty degrees uh, for an hour, about once a week. Um, the other option is a thermal store, and that's a that's sort of indirect um, heat storage. And uh, although you might not need to do Legionella control in that case, you might need to store it at slightly higher temperature so that you can circulate to your mains um, through it and get enough um, and get a, a decent uh, supply temperature. And there's more on this um, on John Cantor's website. Um, I think I failed to mention John Cantor, but um, a lot of this comes from um, um, from his heat pumps website and book. Um, yeah, so you can do a little calculation to size your cylinder, which I won't go through because I think I don't think I've got time. Um, but you can also use this little calculator and just make sure you know what units you're using everything in. Um, so storage volume, um, this is the uplift temperature, so the difference between mains and your storage temperature, uh, your heat pump um, capacity, and then it will tell you um, how long it'll take for the, for the whole 
um, tank to heat up from mains uh, temperature water. There are so many types, um, so what's what's best for my needs? Um, before, before I do that section, Jonathan, do you want to do... Um, do you want to swap over briefly? Yeah, to, to yeah. do the... Um, how, how you get the process bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, so... That will stop your screen sharing. Could you, yeah. Flo, yes. could you tell me if my audio goes off? Because one of the comments in the chat was yes. that uh, my audio went dodgy and I can move to a better room <laughs> um, if <laughs> necessary. So, yeah. Yeah. okay, so I'm just going to talk really briefly about how you get hold of a heat pump, what kind of process you might go through. Uh, Flo's been really good on outlining the technical aspects, kind of um, how heat pumps operate, kind of some of the underlying technicalities to them as well but I'm like if you're interested in getting one how would you go about it and really kind of simply there were some different stages to getting a heat pump basically from starting out from just interested to getting one in your house and, and beyond and um, I've just outlined them briefly here advice assessment design installation and monitoring and evaluation and just to fill fill that out in terms of advice, uh, retrofit advisors are out there or other sources of trusted advice that you might know. Uh, unfortunately, energy, energy saving trust is a lot less um, extensive than it used to be, but those kinds of people. And really at the start, you're thinking, is it right for us? Um, is now the time or should we do it later? Uh, do we have the cash? Are there other things we should be thinking about beyond heat pumps? You know, maybe it's about improving the fabric or, uh, or just like, you know, re re repair and maintenance and what have you. So it's kind of thinking about things first before moving forward. Once you think that it is for you, the next stage is assessment. And, and Flo has talked a little bit about assessments. Uh, people in the chat have been talking about EPCs. That's a form of assessment. It's nowhere near detailed enough to think about heat pumps, but that gives you an idea about what might, what's involved. An assessor or a surveyor will get involved at this stage. So how will a heat pump work with other improvements, for example? If you're reducing heat demand through fabric, what kind of size heat pump? How do the sums add up? And that's where you start thinking about RHI, because you're thinking about how much heat demand, what kind of, uh, kind of in incentive might we get? And then it's about what kind of size system. So you're looking at your house and how you, the heat pump fits then. Then you've got a better idea of how that might fit and what kind of money you're thinking about. The next stage is design. And that's where someone like an engineer like Florence would get involved. That's then, you know the size of the system you want, but the specification, whether you bring in a, a buffer tank, uh, how, uh, uh, how the system fits schematically with other kind of services in the house. People have talked about pairing it with different systems and what have you. So at that stage, you bring in an engineer who does that kind of schematic work and design work and more detailed modeling. Then it's procurement, looking for an installer, who will work to this specification, um, who's gonna do the work and what they're gonna charge. And it's at that point you get an exact kind of uh, um, fee, you know you know what you're gonna be paying. I would say this is really challenging to start because um, there's a lot of demand out there and there's not that many installers. Um, MCS has come up a few times. MCS is the kind of quality registration system that you need the installer to have that qualification to do the installation to qualify for the RHI. What I would say is that's great and MCS is good, but we've also seen very poor installations in MCS. So it's not about MCS is fine and that's all you need. It's about doing due diligence and finding the right kind of installers who, who deliver to the quality. And after you've had it all installed, after it's been working, it's monitoring and evaluation, keeping on top of it. These aren't boilers, they don't run like boilers. In some senses, you need to kind of understand and learn how the system works and, and there's a whole behavioral change piece there. They're not, they're not like um, spaceships, you know, they're, they're, they're easy to get a hold of, but they just do operate differently to a boiler. Now, oh, uh, and what I didn't say is at the bottom, you can just get a contractor in and a contractor can do some or all of these processes in one go. 
and so there are two kind of routes there. One is this kind of uh, engineer-led, perhaps you might say, approach, and another is kind of just get a design an installer in and they do it all. Obviously, you then place all your trust in the installer, and there are some times where the installers maybe don't do the same level of diligence that an engineer would do, or you don't have the same independence. I suppose with this engineer-led route, you could be doing that as well, depending on how competent you feel in these different aspects. And there are tools online, you know, and you can get to grips with it. Or you can bring in people powered retrofit. This is part of our service. And what we do, we offer advice. We have a home retrofit planner assessment. We do design and procurement using people like Flow. We have um, installers that we work with and a QA system, and we have monitoring and evaluation. So you can get people like us, if you're in, we work in Greater Manchester, Cheshire, if you're in other parts of the country, there are some other services like this. But I don't want to kid anyone, this is an emerging technology. As I said, demand's gone through the roof. We'll see installation and the whole supply chain catching up, but it's certainly not there at the moment. So you can't, it's, it's, it's challenging to walk out the door and find an installer the next day. Okay, so that's my bit, Flo. Uh, so I'll hand back to you. Great, that's, that's fantastic. So if I just share my screen again. Um, right. So, yeah, I think uh, Jonathan touched on this slightly in that uh, we you'll be choosing a model and an installer. Um, and this is the kind of, um, this is the route that Andy was proposing in one of his um, webinars, decide on the type, the make, the model, um, choose the installer, design the system, um, install and then commission and operate. And as Andy would say, you need to get all of those five things right um, for a, a really well performing um, installation. Um, some of the design you might do um, prior to choosing the type, make and model, like just the basic sizing and stuff. Um, but then you'd, you'd need a more uh, detailed um, uh, specification. Um, there is a little tool on the BRE website to compare different models based on historical um, in field, out, out in the field data. So um, that's something that you can play around with if you want. Um, you might decide that the refrigerant is a um, is a key concern. Um, uh, they very rarely leak, um, but it is something to consider. And obviously, at some point in their life, they will be dis disposed of. The, the gas is supposed to be recovered, um, but you could imagine. Um, some of that being released and so each of these refrigerants has um, a global warming uh, potential value. Um, these are no longer um, uh, lawful uh, because you have to have zero depletion potential, ozone, ozone deple depletion potential, um, but these are um, some of your more typical um, heat pump refrigerants, um, but we're seeing R32, which is obviously a lot less in terms of global warming potential um, coming up on the market, and I'll, I'll show you one in a minute. Um, and then, so pre the 1950s, um, there were more natural refrigerants like ammonia and, um, and carbon dioxide. So um, you never know. Well, yes, ammonia might be making a comeback actually. Um, so this is a, and it, I think we've been through this, but this is the eight kilowatt um, split uh, with underfuel heating. Um, it also has solar thermal um, and a domestic hot water tank there. Um, This is a recent um, eight kilowatt Mitsubishi Ecogun installation um, for uh, quite, a, quite a high level of, of refurbishment of a bungalow. Um, the UPC had 8,600 kilowatt hours per year of heating. 
um, that's the cost of the installation. Um, and then it was 1,500 for the uh, 150 litre ditch domestic hot water centre. Um, she switched to a um, variable rate, an agile tariff, um, which means the electricity is cheaper at night. Uh, but she's also got, and she's got a heat miser in thermostats, uh, which apparently drive, drove her insane, but she's now getting used to it. So there is hope for everyone. Um, and then um, an efficient wood burning stove, um, I think just for, just because she could. Um, I, it sounds like an eight kilowatt Mitsubishi will um, more than be, be more than adequate for her particular case. I haven't designed any of these, by the way. These are just um, installation um, uh, examples. This is the, the larger inst installation that we talked about, 16 kilowatts. Uh, it did replace an oil-fired boiler and hot water cylinder. Um, it has a buffer tank um, and there is also additional heat from an open fireplace in that particular case. Uh, this is the newest one that I think um, flashed up earlier. Um, so I, my understanding is that um, the client requested ultra quiet operation. So I think this is a slightly larger unit. Um, and I could only see two models, which was eight, eight and a half and 11 kilowatts. Um, and this is with a new refrigerant R32, but it is quite a bit larger than I expected. Um, they do have a wood burning stove, and this was the um, this was the cost of the installation. Um, it included a hot water. This is a bespoke hot water cylinder. Um, this was meant to be the space where it was going in, but when they disconnected the gas, they left the stub in here. So um, do uh, do be extra vigilant when you ask for these things to be done. It just meant. So the space was unusable for the tank in the end so um so this is what they um they ended up with and on that we um move into installation operation and uh, monitoring um so hopefully you found the right installer uh one that you trust because they've been recommended um, ideally, the installer will also be willing to come back a couple of times after the installation to make sure everything's running um, as it should, uh, maybe make, help you make adjustments during the heating season. Um, so, um, install to the designer's outline specification and manufacturer's instructions, they will be quite specific to those um, units. The um, the installer can confirm some of the additional system components, uh, but they, they really ought to be agreed with the designer um, as they go in. And um, the installer will decide, decide on how it's all supported, but you might have um, additional requirements such as vibration uh, control, just check that they're appropriate. Um, and if it's a, a monoblock installation, it might well be um, a plumber that you trust um, who's perfectly qualified to install pipe work and things and um, if they have the sort of attitude that they they want to learn and um, and they take pride in, in their installations then they're they're probably that the, your best bet actually um, and they can go on you know training courses and upskill in that way and the more we, we can do that the, the, the more we um, we improve the industry uh, one of my own particular bugbears is insulation around pipes. Um, it's best to have proprietary clips for that insulation rather than tape or cable ties, which tend to squash the insulation, make it um, a little bit useless, really. Um, there is a checklist. So um, the Institute, the Limerick Institute of Technology um, have published a best practice um, guide for heat pump retrofits. Um, and this list is taken straight out of there in terms of commissioning um, and good commissioning uh, as a checklist. Um, I could go through some of the points, but um, you know, check that the circuits are properly uh, 
balanced, um, check the manufacturer specifics um, for the controller settings and, um, and set the appropriate domestic hot water settings and le Legionella protection plans. Um, and hopefully, yes, um, there'll be some follow-up site visits. In terms of controls and monitoring, there are plenty of, so each manufacturer will have its own um, app and uh, controllers. Um, they tend to be optimized for their technology, so um, it's probably just as well to go with those. The thermostat needs to be uh, in, a, in a sensible position. Um, and that means that it's not where there's huge uh, variance in temperature, but due to other factors or you know, it's not too close to a radiator, it's in um, a more central zone um, that won't be sensing. So the purpose of the thermostat is to trigger the heat pump to come on in terms of set points. So you don't want it next to um, a window where it'll get warm and then just, um, or a radiator where it'll get warm and just uh, not give a signal to um, the heat pump. And also you don't want huge variations because you don't want um, to trip everything on and off. So um, that's really key. Um, in most cases you can specify, you can specify your own controls. Uh, if you prefer certain systems, you just need to check their comp compatibility. Uh, whether compensation is a whole um, PhD in itself, um, but the Super Homes um, guide will covers that pretty well um, and then you will have um, data at your fingertips. Well we um, just need a couple couple of minutes to wrap it up and then because we've got loads of questions for you. Florence. Yeah I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> um, right very quickly um, you can so data being power um, if you want to improve anything um, you can add your own and this um, Open energy monitoring system is a, is a good way to go about it. Um, so, and you can have these clip on um, heat meters, um, which uh, are really uh, quite fun. Um, there are certain things that um, affect heat pump performance. So, one of the big things is compressor cycling. So, that's the number of times the compressor is switched on and off um, in an hour, for example. Um, to deliver the heat and you want to minimize that as much as possible for your best um, COPs. Um, the defrost cycle, so um, older units will have ice buildup um, which can lead to about a 10% drop in efficiency overall um, but more modern ones will have its own um, defrost cycle and that's more like a 1% drop um, again, the Super Homes report um, goes into a lot of detail. Um, the perils of over and undersizing um, the heat pump, and this is where, um, again, uh, we could go on for quite a, quite a long time, but ideally you match the heat pump uh, peak load to your, your peak heat demand. Um, based on those design temperatures and then um, you size your, um, you, you get hot water um, at that size. Um, it may mean compromising on, on waiting for the hot water um, to, um, to get to temperature or you will be topping up with immersion heater or your solar thermal or your um, PV. Um, and then uh, there is what we call a weather compensation curve. They, they can cause problems um, and it might not be appropriate for installations. Again, um, it has to be looked at on a case-by-case a -case basis. Um, compressor cycling, we mentioned. So um, ways to avoid high cycling is um, is to have larger a larger volume in the system. So that's why um, underfloor heating provides it. So there's a large, you know, there's, there's a long length of pipe with water inside it. Um, and that helps to keep um, the heat pump running smoothly. If, if there isn't a large volume within the system itself, then um, a buffer tank uh, might well be needed. 
Um, and then, yes, we mentioned the ice buildup and defrost cycles. Um, so hopefully, um, after all this, you know um, the basic physics of a heat pump um, and how it's not a boiler. Um, what you need to do to make your um, house more ready to accept a, a heat pump system. Um, you know a bit more about uh, the number of components that go in. Do you have the space? Do you have the budget? Um, you know a bit more about the design process, how to procure the, ins the installation, uh, the choice of heat pump models and other components, um, and finally ins the installation, the operation. So um, I think uh, the next two slides are just resources. So I'll just um, I'll keep this up, shall I? And yeah. Well, um, we'll we'll have the whole um, um, set of slides um, shared. So let's let's go through some questions because uh, mm. we've got quite a lot. Um, let's start with a very common one that came through. Um, there was a talk about noise. How noisy are these? Um, should people be worried worried about noise for their neighbours or noise for themselves, keeping themselves at work at night, that sort of thing? Um, okay, so uh, traditionally they have been quite noisy in terms of, but in so much as they were, they you know when the compressors on um, or the fans on, sorry, they um, you get a, you get a hum like when your fr your fridge is is going and. Um, when that's outside it can be a little bit um but just a little bit irritating but you know um they're just like air conditioning units in the on the continent um if you're used to seeing those um and like i said there's a there's a brand new unit from uh mitsubishi which is an ultra quiet and um Dakin, i know have um quiet mode so you can operate it in quiet mode Obviously, you will need to check these things out if you are in a built-up area with um, lots of close neighbours or apartments. Yeah. yeah. Does it, do they need uh, planning uh, in terms of like noise or, or anything else? That does depend where you are. I think it doesn't. It doesn't automatically need planning, but some environmental health officers um, are keener to avoid them than others. So. You might need cool. to do a calculation or get somebody to do a calculation. Okay, so we've had a few questions around uh, buffer tanks. In what cases do you need a buffer tank? <laughs> um, it's not something I can uh, categorically say um, you need or, or don't. It will depend on uh, the number of circuits you have, the inertia of the particular system, how, you know, how many radiators you've got in there, whether you've got underfloor heating. So, um, but um, it is a calculation that you can do um, based on, on what you've got. And then the manufacturer will have a sort of cutoff um, or a recommended system volume. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, there a downsize to, or is there a downside to oversizing radiators, apart from maybe a visual effect? Um, a downside to oversize. I'm not sure if that's oversizing based on the fact that it's a heat pump system. I suppose replacing uh, normal size radiators with bigger ones um, for yeah to cope with the yeah. yeah. I mean, you, if you drop the temperature, you will need um, and you don't do anything else, um, you will need a bigger. A larger radiator to get the same output. Um, if you if you insulate your house um, really well, you might not need to do that. Um, so there's no oversized. You know, if you're going to size the radiator, size it for the um, for the duty. Yes. But if you have to replace it with larger radiators, then you just have a larger radiator. radiator yeah, I suppose that that the face impact. It? Yeah. A minimal of disruption, but I would say the ones that we saw in Ireland, they, they to the eye, didn't look that much bigger than a normal. No, well, sometimes it's just um, about you know it's width rather than length, um, and also you can get um, fan-assisted ones. So um, yeah, it might not have an impact at all. 
we we've had a few questions slightly despairing questions about the cost of things you know like oh god five grand is a minimum and like these other quotes are quite high um uh chris hoff says how can we get people to go to heat pumps when gas boilers are you know less disruptive and less and cheaper you know um so maybe that's a bit more of a, a policy sort of uh yeah kind of question i think and i think that's why the grants are there um so actually if you do go for an rhi although the initial costs might be a bit um quite a bit higher um as you get it paid back and it actually your your payback rate increases with the um, with the index i can't remember the consumer index um it does cover most of that cost and you might be left with maybe a, a grand or a, a grand and a half that you put in yourself so i think somewhere in there there's a little bit of um price setting in that uh it seems to correlate with the price of a boiler basically yes <laughs> yeah yeah totally yeah yeah I think it's, I know people make, have been making policy based things like we need a mass rollout, we need, you know, large scale delivery. Uh, we totally echo that, you know, and that's stuff we're lobbying for. For yeah. us, it's kind of a bottom up process where we can influence yeah. other people uh, yeah. by showing what's possible, really. Yeah. Um, and I think some of it yeah. is because there's no, not enough, there's not enough installers um, because, you know, an air conditioning unit installation is usually a lot less than that um, commercially. So yep. um, it doesn't, doesn't really stack up. Um, there's a question from Anne Clark about the efficiency of air to air source um, and someone else, Ian Barker, about whether if, if uh, he's like in a house without any, um, re uh, without any wet radiators, whether the, whether the system, can it go from, from that to air source heat pumps? Yeah, absolutely. So that's exactly what, um, so if you think of an air conditioning system with a multi-split, um, you know, those air conditioners or they can be sort of um, floor mounted um, air, uh, what do you call them, emitters. Yes. Um, but actually there's refrigerant, like, you know, um, circulating in those. So you've got your outdoor unit and then you've got refrigerant pipe work between all the units. So, um, and then you're delivering that heat or that cool um directly to the air with a fan so um or from above you know yeah just like a, an air conditioning system that you've you might have seen a visible one <laughs> if you uh, like a little run of questions now about pairing air source heat pumps with other things so yeah. um or in comparison to other things so um air source heat pumps versus thermodynamic panels so do you want to very quickly uh, uh, explain thermodynamic panels? I'm not entirely sure what they mean by thermodynamic panels. I think they are the uh, infrared uh, radiators. Uh, they're like purely electric and they kind of, they heat you but not the air. Right, okay. So radiant panels. Yes. Uh, yes, they will, like you say, they will heat the person radiatively. Um, so they work a little bit like underfloor heating, but at much higher temperature. Um, that can be quite a, an uncomfortable heat because it's such a different, um, is that right? Because yes. all your surfaces yes. are all different temperatures, so yeah, it's yeah. an asymmetry. Um, and if it's electrical, then um, you're putting all the, so all the energy comes from electricity. Um, I mean, it's, it, highly efficient in its conversion um you know one one kilowatt of supply to the panel uh, electrically will give you one kilowatt of heat out but um obviously with a, a heat pump system you're we're looking to do three or four um in that respect so yeah um a few questions about uh so hybrid heat pumps uh thoughts on when you have heat pump like uh, paired with a gas backup, which I've seen a few. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think um, the more complexity you introduce into a system, the more complex it is. <laughs> um, so then you're, um, uh, I mean, if it's all handled by the, the unit itself, then you don't 
you don't really notice a difference but again you're on gas so you haven't really eliminated the gas um, I guess it helps to boost the uh, the capacity of the of the unit um, but I think I'd prefer to see um, the bricks and mortar being insulated better and um, and having that kind of approach I, I just haven't really looked into them yes Okay, well, one one last uh, one last uh, kind of pairing, um, Sunamp heat batteries, um, and one of our members, Dominic McCann, who's Zappa Man on Twitter, is constantly tweeting about his Sunamp battery. He's very pleased with, uh, and he's actually going for a, a air source heat pump now. But I don't know whether you have any experience of pairing these kind of different things, or I guess also um, people that maybe want solar thermal panels or. So the PV panels that will divert into hot water. Can you pair all these kind of systems together? Oh, um, yes, absolutely. Um, so Sunamp, I'm not that up on. I know somebody mentioned it a few in the previous course. I should really have um, looked into it a bit more, sorry. <laughs> um, well, you can follow him on Twitter because he's I always could. tweeting about I'll, it. <laughs> I'll follow him. Um, <laughs> And but in terms of integrating technologies, so that's one way to get your um, hot water cylinder working um, a lot more uh, leanly in terms of you know um, not demanding that much heat from the um, from the heat pump system or from your immersion heater. So solar thermal, it, I love the technology. Um, it's been a little bit of the um, been a little bit neglected the last few years but there is RHI for solar thermal um, and there are still some installers out there I hope um, and um, yeah I would definitely recommend those for your hot water demand um, and then solar PV I mean the battery technologies are, are getting um, so much better um, there's still you know there's there's still an aspect of battery technology that needs sorting out in terms of sustainability of it but um with electric vehicles coming on online and and stuff it makes sense to have um solar pv yep. um, you can also have a solar pv diverter to your hot water tank or thermal store so you use the you know you no longer get the um feed-in tariffs for example um so anything that helps you use your energy directly and your hot water tank is basically a store for that energy um the better really cool um richard smith has a good uh, he's got a few good questions he says do you keep the temperature constant um or do you want it turning off in the day and the night i guess that's a bit you know is it more like a boiler where you put it on when you're cold or is it kind of always on um i think uh, so with with modern thermostats you can have um you can have your sort of occupied temperature or your daytime temperature and then you can have a, a different set set point as a setback temperature so yeah. it might mean that it's not totally off but you're just maintaining 15 degrees when you when you don't need any other heat or whatever or 60 mm. degrees and then you'll have a holiday mode and all that. So I think the controls yeah. come into play there and it is better to keep something um, on, a, on more of an even keel than constantly yep. on and off. Where it, but a boiler is, is, is that, you know, it comes on, it yes. gives you heat and then it comes off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Richard also has another good question, or a few questions actually, which are kind of <laughs> like, with a limited amount of money, and maybe not the leakiest house in the world, you know, I've got a fairly, fairly okay, it could be better, you know, do you put the money into fabric first, or do you go for the heat pump, you know, and, and, and I know I can see if it's really leaky cold property, you want to go for your fabric first, but where there's a bit more of a, um, unsure, what do you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I think it it also depends on your personal drivers. So if you wanted to come off gas, um, then, you know, at the moment, it makes sense to go for a heat pump. I think there will be, there will come a time when it might 
you know, the, the choice will be between the heat pump and direct electricity because the electricity will be mainly renewable. Um, but in the in the next decade, I think it's heat pumps. Um, yeah. So, and if you want to, if you, you're desperate to phase out of gas, um, then do that by all means, and then maybe do everything else um, bit by bit. But maybe go for maybe a bit, be a bit lean on the design. Yes. And then top up, and then do your retrofit so that you don't. Um, you know, do overkill as it were. Yeah, and I think maybe our advice would be to sort of have a plan, you know? So yeah. it's not necessarily, yeah, you you know, you go through things in the order that you go through them, but you have a wider plan so that you don't risk doing things that you need to remove later on or you wrongly size things and you've got to replace quite fundamental things. So a good energy assessment um, is a good way to create a framework for a plan. Totally um, that, yeah. Uh, maybe a couple more questions. One, we've had a few on hot water and the temperature of hot water. So yeah. if an air source heat pump is hot water at 35 degrees, um, how can you get direct hot water up to 60 degrees? And a question about things like Legionella and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just because you set your flow temperature at 35 or 40 doesn't mean your heat pump isn't capable of getting it up to 45, 50. So when it is on um, domestic hot water mode, it might actually kick up to a different temperature uh, and that's how you would heat your hot water. Um, and then you will have an immersion backup, so that will, um, that will do the extra uh, as well. So that's, that's an important thing to discuss with the installer how, you know, and, and look at how the manufacturer deals with, with that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of Legionella, so that's, yeah, I kind of um, didn't go into huge amounts of detail, but um, so that's, so if you're worried about it, um, then um, <coughs> you might prefer to go for the thermal store option and then get, um, and you can, you can store the, the, temp, the water at a slightly lower temperature than 60 maybe 50, 55, um, and then you would circulate your mains water through that like you would a combi boiler um, and just get instantaneous hot from that. Um, with the hot water cylinder, then there's a Legionella control um, regime and that's set through the, the controls of the, um, the heat pump anyway. Um, it is something that needs commissioning, but you set um, an hour in the middle of the night, uh, usually, um, so you, people don't get scalded. <laughs> um, and it, so it brings the temperature up to 60 for an hour and then kicks back down again. Right, yeah. Uh, good question here. <laughs> two, two last questions. Okay. Is the RHAI calculated on energy used or predicted, like models, say, for, on an EPC basis? Um, so it's purely on the EPC. So if your EPC reflects your current situation, um, but it's been modelled using um, SAP, yeah. so um, the standard assessment procedure, um, it might not match your consumption at all, um, but it will be, you know, it will be the closest thing to your consumption based on, on UK benchmarks. Um, and your, uh, yeah, so your RHI is, is based on that um, yeah. Yeah. prediction. Cool. Yeah. And then last one, um, so uh, this might be in your resources, but are there any worked examples of costs, Alison asks, installation costs, grants, annual operating because I can I know people have got these things going in their head which is like size of thing cost up front uh you know RHI and then PIM you know and, mm. and so are there any kind of like worked examples on the internet or even calculators I guess that people can use uh actually on the MCS website there is a tool that you can use um and you put in 
the values from your EPC. Um, I'll look up there. Oh, that's the one resource I haven't put on there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can we can add it and then for the for for the circulation. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I have I've definitely seen some calculators out there. MCS website, maybe maybe the Energy Savings Trust as well might have them yeah, as well. Yeah, in the resource um, section, yeah, and um, you, uh, you know, an installer might actually send you the. The analysis itself but yeah you need to know how to how to read the information cool okay thank you Florence that was like a a, a whistle stop tour <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, which was fantastic so it gives uh, hopefully it gives people a really good understanding of the, the the science of the physics of the of heat pumps and how they operate um, how you can uh, find the right installers, find the right incentives. I mean, as we've said, really, it's a new and emerging area. Really sorry we couldn't get through all the questions. Um, we did our, our level best to, and if you drop us a line, we can try and answer them as well. Um, I would say uh, we don't answer specific questions about your specific house uh, just from email because, you know, we've never seen your house and we don't want to make any mistakes. Um, People Powered Retrofit Service operates in Greater Manchester and, and South Cheshire and, and a bit bit beyond there, Richard Smith, like a little bit outside of Greater Manchester, he's been on the chat. So um, yeah, we're happy to work with people and integrate as part of our service. It's a costed service, but, but it's very reasonable in the context of the amounts being spent. Mm -hmm. um, I have dropped a link in the chat. Uh, please have a look at it uh, because it is uh where we're going to do some fun feedback um <laughs> hopefully fun anyway um so i'll just show you now if you look at the um if you can hopefully see my can you see that florence the h yep. form so this is a uh, h form so and it's is a quick and fun and simple way to give us some feedback on tonight um, we did our level best to give you what you need but we can't always do the right things so what we'd like you to do is using the uh, board, the, this um, toolbar on the left hand side, using the pen, give us a mark out of 10, one to 10. Just give us a level mark up and down. There you go. That's like five and a half out of 10. Now using the sticky notes, tell us if, how we did basically. <laughs> um, you can just drop us a message here. It was good. It wasn't good. On the left hand side, it's good things. On the right hand side, it's bad things. Uh, and below, uh, below the H line, recommendations, things we should do differently in the future to make this a bit better. Um, uh, yeah, anything to you, any kind of examples you can give us. Fantastic people already giving us marks out of 10. It really, really does help us make this better uh, and improve stuff. No. Don't go drawing things everywhere. If you want to put a, if you want to put a suggestion, use the sticky notes. Yeah, uh, the sticky notes here on the left hand side. And um, yeah, just type us what was good. There we go. <laughs> Questions as well as answer. I don't know if that's good or bad, but yeah, put them on left hand side if it's good, right hand side if it's not so good, and we can do better recommendations on the bottom. And we'll leave this open. Well, you can use this all night, but we'll leave the we'll leave the webinar open for the ten or fifteen minutes, and we can um, uh, we can maybe answer some chat questions. Uh, Florence might need to go, but I'll be around for a bit. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. We will put everything out. We'll circulate everything uh, on email tomorrow. So yeah, Florence, thank you very much. Ah, oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Take care.